Hey everyone, I'm Brent, this is Vijay, we're from F5. We're gonna talk about how we integrated DPDK into the Big IP Load Balancer, our, our virtual edition. Um, James mentioned earlier that you certainly ask questions. Um, and if you hear what we're saying and you wanna talk more about it, or you're curious, or you think we did something wrong and you wanna bring that up, we'll be just in the back after this is over. Please feel free to come back and chat with us or meet us tonight or tomorrow some, sometime. So just a, briefly about F5, we've been around for quite a while. We make application delivery controllers and that's physical appliances as well as, oh no, it's doing the auto scroll thing. Don't do that. We make physical appliances and virtual appliances. We're gonna be talking primarily about virtual appliances today, because that's the team that I manage and that, that VJ works on. Actually, we can, we can leave it right on that, that, that next one. Yep. So how does, how does Big IP make use of DPDK? Well, the, the Big IP application delivery controller, it has it has effectively one process that controls almost the entire data plan. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but for this conversation, we have one process that really matters for that. It's called the TMM, the Traffic Management Microkernel. It's just a standard Linux process, but it's the, the, the full stack. So it has device drivers, it has our TCP IP stack in it, it does compression, acceleration, um, security, uh, things like crypto offload. Um, as well as many application layer protocols that it, it understands natively. And it does that in a way that it can proxy it client and server side for accomplishing things like load balancing. Uh, it can manipulate traffic and do um, advanced authentication, SSL VPN, um, as well as things like firewalling for applications, web applications, that sort of thing. So it's really kind of the crown jewels of, of F5 and the, the whole data plane behind how, how big IP works. Um, and it actually shares quite a bit in common with DPDK before we were even using it. Um, this about, it's about a 15 year old program. It's been around for quite a while. We keep adding on to it as time goes by. But it has quite a bit of functionality that's in common with, with DPDK that, that, that we've been doing for quite a while. So um, it has pull mode drivers for our high performance networking. It has its own, its own scheduler built into it. Um, it manages all the huge pages that the system has, so it has its own memory allocator that's purpose-built for processing network traffic. And for the, for the, for the stance of the, the processors that it runs on, we spin off a number of threads for each of those and then pin those to individual processors and run those as if we own them generally. We will yield to let other processes in Linux run, but typically we assume we have the whole box and we make use of it as we, as we need to. Now to make all this work, there's some pretty nice properties that the TMM has. Um, it's zero copy whenever possible. So clearly if you're doing something like compression or crypto, you can't do straight zero copy there. But if it's, if it's, you know, if it's a kind of packet that we can take it in and proxy it and send it back out again without needing to manipulate it or change it, um, if, and even if we have to change it somewhat, we can still do zero copy quite a bit it'll pass it the whole way through without doing any, any extra memory um, ops there. Um, and it's fully user programmable. So this is our iRules technology. As we process things up the stack and back down, we'll naturally raise events that our users can uh, attach small tickle scripts to. And that allows them to do things like make decisions based on what's happening, based on what we see in the packets. They can manipulate them, make changes to them. They can do things like logging, they can drop it, make load balancing decisions, all that sort of thing. So it's, what I'm trying to get to here is we have this, this engine that's, that's very mature, we've had it for a long time, um, and it's very high performance, and it's very in tune. Um, there are a couple other things that come out of it, but for the most part, all of the data plane happens in this, this, this one daemon. Now I mentioned before that we have pull mode drivers. Um, when we were working with physical appliances, that was, that was the way to do it, obviously. Um, we would write our own drivers, we'd make an appliance, we'd pick a NIC or two for it, we would know what they were, and we'd make a driver for it, and that's what we would use. Um, as we moved into virtual appliances, to an extent, that's what we continued to do. Um, 
with virtual appliances, you commonly have VirtIO or VMXNet3 devices, and we have native drivers for those. But we began to see other kinds of NICs that we didn't have device drivers for. We couldn't always predict that. So we came up with a couple of techniques that we can use to get those packets without having to have a device driver directly in the TMM. So we did that using either a raw socket or we have a kernel module that we can insert into Linux that lets us do an extra, like an extra copy there. But those are typically interrupt driven and they do involve extra copies. There's some extra coalescing that, that has to happen and performance in the few gigabit range is probably fine, but as we get into higher speed devices, things like SRIOV in 10 and 40 gig, that, that kind of capped out there and we're, we're not seeing the performance that we wanted to with that. So from a stance of performance, but also just how we keep up with the raw number of network devices that we're seeing, we decided we needed to do something to make it easier to get more performance and lower overhead to adding NICs and DPDK made, made perfect sense there. So we then had to consider, well, how do we preserve all these, all these nice properties we have in the TMM, keep all of its performance and keep us this, this highly configurable, highly flexible engine? How do we keep all that working while still adding, adding NICs through DPDK for that? And that's what we're, we're gonna get into is how we tackled those challenges and what some of them were and how we, how we ultimately got, got over them. So the answer to how we went about uh, combining those two things together is we added a, an extra layer. So this is, this is a block diagram of the very bottom portion of the TMM stack. It's showing how the device drivers fit in. And you'll notice off to the far lower right, we have this thing called the XNet library with DPDK there. And then directly above that, there's an XNet driver that's in the TMM. Now, everything on the screen here, with the exception of the kernel and the network drivers under, underneath it, that's all still part of the TMM process. So um, we're, not, we're not doing IPC or anything. That's all, that's all directly within the TMM still, including the XNet library and, and DPDK. You'll notice we have a whole other tier of drivers that are next to XNet, um, VertIO, VMXNet3, IXLV, and a bunch of other ones that we don't even have on the, on the screen here. What that's representing are device drivers that we already, we already had. You'll notice that some of these are ones that are common that DPDK offers. So the first thing that we did when we got DPDK up and running inside of this is we added support to drive those interfaces that we already had support for. So we could see, are they working the way that we expected to? Do we have the, the right kinds of features? Is, is it performing well? That sort of thing. Um, and we were generally pretty happy with the performance we got out of DPDK. Um, we did notice it was just because of the abstraction that we added, it was a little bit slower than our native drivers, but performed very well. Certainly much better than either the raw socket or the Unic that you see on the left side of that, of that diagram there. So, that was certainly very good. Now, why did we add the XNet library and XNet driver there rather than just directly communicating with DPDK? Well, the answer there is, I mentioned before how kind of how, how mature the TMM is. Well, we've squeezed every last ounce of performance out of that that we generally can. And there are some things where we wanted to sort of maintain a layer of of anonymity between the TMM and DPDK in both directions. We didn't want to have to maintain a private fork of DPDK for changes we had to make to it. We also didn't want to make the TMM aware that we had DPDK running underneath it. So we added this XNet library and driver underneath, underneath TMM around DPDK so that we could, we could have that abstraction layer to keep everything straight. And if we had to translate one way or the other, we could do that in a nice, neat way. Um, but I'll stress that DPDK in our case doesn't know that it has TMM above it. It just sees a layer that's pulling packets and pushing packets down to it. And the TMM doesn't know that it has DPDK underneath it. It just sees an XNet device and has no knowledge that it's actually DPDK under the hood down there. So that lets us maintain a nice, ab a nice abstraction between those. Yep. So the way that we went about doing this was we, we were able to maintain our zero copy, and VJ is going to talk to that in a, in a little while about how that was a challenge, but how we ultimately got around it. But basically, the TMM's memory manager provides the huge pages that DPDK uses. 
Um, we have some querying mechanisms where we can push down through XNet and ask, ask XNet on behalf of, of, of DPDK <laughs> what acceleration features are available for a given NIC and ultimately to, to pass on the PCI coordinates and say attached to this device, use these offload features and query back and forth and negotiate whether that was gonna work or not, whether we had checked some offloading, t uh, things like TSO, um, LRO, that sort of thing. We would give it the memory after we knew how many rings it needed, the number of queues it had, how, how large the ring should be. We got all that laid out. And then from there, it was shared memory between those to where we could actually do zero copy between the, the DPDK up through XNet to TMM and then, and then back down without losing too much performance. Yeah. So we're gonna get into now some of the challenges that we ran into with doing that and how we, how we got about, about solving those. Um, I'm gonna let Vijay speak to that though. So I've been the main person working on the uh, integrating DPDK with uh, TMM in a seamless manner. So I'll be covering as uh, Brent said, uh, the challenges that we faced. So the first and foremost is uh, like sharing the huge pages between DPDK and TMM. So we wanted to retain the TMM's memory ownership, like taking huge pages initially, uh, and then TMM launched uh, DPDK later, later on. So we wanted to continue that model. So TMM still takes uh, huge pages and uh, uh, shares it with DPDK before calling the RT EAL in it. Uh, so we introduced a new API called RTEAL import huge page. It's a very simple API that just transfers uh, huge page metadata that it has, like the virtual address, physical address, and the file offset within the huge TLBFS uh, to DPDK uh, and stores it in a static array. So an RTEAL init is called. Uh, uh, we had to make some tweaks in the RTEAL legacy init function to, uh, to, to take care of the M mapping. I'll cover that part in the next slide. Um, so, yeah. So, so uh, the regular way DPDK does the mapping is like it uses two M map calls to actually uh, to come to arrive at the final uh, contiguous virtual address space. So, uh, and but but by that time, TMM already has an M map uh, of all the huge pages in a, in a single huge page file. Um, so, uh, so I, we had to make some middle ground here to uh, to retain TMM's mapping as well as DPD and uh, as well as allow DPDK to create its own mapping. So, uh, so for that. Uh, Hello? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so for that, what we do is like, um, uh, we pass on the huge page metadata from uh, TMM to DPDK, and uh, uh, in that function, RTEL legacy in it, um, uh, we skip the first M map from DPDK side, um, and, uh, and using the, so the first M map within DPDK is, if you look at the code, it's used m mainly for, to find out the physical address of the pages and sort them based on physical addresses. So, so they can be physically contiguous as much as possible. Um, so that part is taken care of, uh, like the, the physical address info is already supplied by TMM. So, um, so we skip the first MMAP part within DPDK and uh, continue the qu quick sort that's, that's there in the code already. Um, and then uh, after the sort, it does its own M mapping uh, in a different virtual address space than TMM. Um, and uh, in there, there's one more uh, difference is uh, like TMM maps all the huge pages under a single huge TLBFS file, whereas DPDK creates a single p file per huge page. So uh, in, uh, in the second MMAP call, we had to use make use of the the file offset uh, within the uh, within the offset within the file when you do the MMAP. So with these changes, uh, we are able to seamlessly uh, like have DPDK use uh, TMM's memory uh, huge pages, uh, and then like as long as it can. Um, yeah, that's how we solve this issue. So the next is uh, how we achieved um, um, zero copy, uh, retaining our in-house in package structure that is XFRAG, while DPDK uses uh, MBUFs. Uh, so we have retained it in such a way that DPDK continues to use MBUFs and uh, TMM continues to use XFRAGs. Um, so the the way uh, we did it is like uh, we did we did this is by tweaking the external mempool handler that DPDK introduced around in 1604 or 1705. Um, so using the external mempool handler, uh, we uh, attach the X frags allocated by TMM onto the MBUFS payload. Um, so uh, on the MBUF, um, so, 
uh, and then pass it on to DPDK. So this way, uh, the the DMA, the actual DMA happens to the TMM's XFRAG's memory area. Uh, th uh, we implemented this actually in uh, DPDK 17.05 and then later figured like 18.05 has an experimental implementation for this. Uh, we had to look at the, uh, how, how, how good, like since it's experimental, we haven't decided on uh, like going with our approach or the new one. Um, so um, so the, that's uh, pretty much, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> This and then, so the next challenge was um, uh, with uh, s since we use uh, uh, the external mempool handler uh, and extracts come from a TMM, um, the MBUF cache was an issue for us because our stack has reference counts for the X frags. Um, so uh, uh, the, the completed TX buffers cannot be reused for the next RX because the tax, our stack might have reference counts for those buffers and. Uh, uh, so it cannot be assumed that it can be used for next RX. So, um, so we had to turn off the MBUF cache in this case um, to uh, so that like the the memories the buffers of the MBUF is freed back immediately to the XNet and the XNet in turn immediately frees it back to TMM uh, and TMM would look at the the rough count and then decide uh, when to free it. So, um, but turning off the MBUF cache uh, resulted in like performance degradation when we tested with like 16 RX and TXQs and with high throughput um, NIC cards, like 100 gig. Um, so we had to implement a, uh, a, a cache that's very similar to the MBUF cache in the XNet layer. Um, it's pretty much exactly the same, um, but it lives in the XNet layer and it, it, it can free the XFRAX immediately, but retain the MBUFs in the MBUF cache. Um, so, um, uh, so, uh, since I said like the, the, there's an experimental implementation for this in the external mempool handler uh, uh, in 18.05, I thought I'll just put a proposal like um, if there is a way uh, for, for, for the MBUF cache to free the payload to its memory owner, um, that would help our case, like um, that will uh, help an easy, an easy integration. Um, so, um, the other, the next challenge was um, about the way memory is handled, uh, the memory buffers are handled uh, in terms of allocs and frees between DPDK and TMM. So, um, so DPDK's uh, model is like, uh, it does bulk alloc during RX to fill up all the RX descriptors and then on TX uh, also like the completions are freed in bulk. And uh, the amount of bulk varies and it can also be tuned uh, for each driver. Um, so. That was giving us some issues like with, the, with our integration, like when the freeze happen in bulk, our backend queues in the, in the upper part of the stack would get full or something like that. So with the XNet, we had to, we, we did some coil easing to um, make sure that that's, that was taken care of. Um, um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, the challenges that we faced. Um, so one more thing that I'll talk to um, is it's not so much a technical challenge, although there, w there was some engineering in, in, involved, but it's, it's, I don't even know what to call it. It was a challenge that we ran into around when we first got started pulling in uh, different device drivers to use with TPDK. We were using ones that we, we already had drivers for, and they also happened to be ones that tended to not have dependencies for the DPDK drivers. And we, I won't say we got cocky or got spoiled. We were just maybe a little naive. We, we, we got a handful of them working and figured this is how all of them are. This, is, this, is, this will be easy for us. And then we started to take on some others that had dependencies. And I guess I want to encourage anyone working for a vendor who's developing DPDK drivers to consider, consider hard whether you want to have your drivers have external dependencies because it actually put quite a bit of burden on us and slowed us down by a few months on adding some of these, these extra drivers on. Um, when things all sit within TPDK, it was relatively easy to get them working, to test that they were working properly, to do upgrades of the TPDK software itself. Um, the licensing was pretty straightforward. Um, as soon as we have to start pulling in extra packages, now we have different licenses we have a greater attack surface. It potentially exposes features that we don't even care about, but we have to care about them now because they're part of the product. 
um, we have to talk to lawyers. And while I'm, I'm married to a lawyer, I don't want to talk to ones during work at all. Um, so don't make me talk to lawyers. Um, at the end of the day, there are things we can, we can get over. But as far as like killing momentum on a partner, taking up using your nick, this is one that, that honestly got in the way more than I thought it was going to. So while I know we all have engineering decisions to make, and if this gets you to market faster, maybe that's a good path to go, I would encourage everyone to not make that the, the end goal of this. You should, be, you should be actively trying to get all the support you need for DPDK in DPDK itself. Was that our last slide? Yeah, I think so. All right. Um, like I said, please ask us any questions. If you want to have a conversation later, track us down. We're happy to talk. But we have a little over nine minutes left. Yeah. So anybody who has any questions, please make your way to a mic, and we're happy to, to answer them. So... Um in uh, VPP, uh, there is a similar conversion between uh, MBuff to uh, VPP lib, uh, which is same as MBuff to X frags in your case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a performance degradation of almost, uh, I think, 30%, 25 to 30%, depending on uh, platforms. Do you see any performance degradation uh, because of these conversions? Um. No, we haven't, uh, like when we compared with our native drivers, we didn't see uh, performance degradation due to this fact. Okay. Um, but um, it might be a performance degradation if you do a test PMD test maybe, like if you were running it, uh, like that case is like where you don't touch the packet, you just get and put it back into the next queue. But our tests are like L4 and L7 where we have other bottlenecks which might override this bottleneck, I think. Okay, thank you. What was the name of the package you said had the, the v same kind of problem? Uh, VPP, Vector Packet. Person. VPP, yeah, yeah, okay. Thanks. All right. Sounds like that's all the questions we have. Track us down if you have anything you want to. Oh, maybe there's, there's one more. At least one more. I, uh, I think you said you didn't fork DPDK. But you seem to have made changes. Could you just explain that, please? So we, we tried very hard not to make changes to DPDK. I think there were a couple of small changes that we had to make yeah. still. Yeah, we do. Uh, like the, the huge pages, uh, export, importing the huge pages from TAMM, that had some changes. And um, what else? Um, pretty much the memory management related stuff. Um, so we don't allocate the MBUF as a full size, like 2K because f just to save memory, so we, we allocate, so MBUF size is the size of its header, and the payload is made, uh, we make the payload point, buffer pointer point to the X frag. Um, so we have some changes for that. Yeah, we're, we're certainly not guarding those changes carefully or anything. Um, I don't know if they're useful to others. We would be open to discussing them, how to, how to get them out there. Um, they, were, they were fairly minor, though. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> one, more, one more question. Um, are you using LTS DPDK or one of the other uh, releases? 1805 is currently we are at, at 1805. Okay, thank you. And we started out on 1705 yeah, and then we had to upgrade at one point. Okay, thanks. I have a question. So uh, when you integrate uh, with uh, DPDK, it means that it will use the uh, polymod driver. So it means that your CPU will be pulling and uh, the tra traffic. So it will, that it will impact your performance for the CPU cycles. Um. Or, or, or for example, in, do you need to enable interrupt mode or just the pulling mode driver? I mean, I didn't get the question completely. Can You're asking if we had to enable something special for the pull mode drivers? Uh, I mean, um, Pulling mode driver will burning the CPU. It will pulling the packet, so it will cost the CPU cycles. So when the traffic is not very heavy, did you in enable some kind of, for, for example, interrupt mode? So we we did our best to fit the pull mode drivers into our existing model, which also use pull mode drivers. And when there's not much traffic, we have 
we have support for, for sleeping and yielding during that. So we simply weren't giving runtime to DPDK to pull packets at that point. But as the packet rate went up, we would give it more opportunities to yeah. run. So we, we sort of uh, self-throttled it in, you know, in that manner. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. So, yes, uh, two questions. Well, two comments. <laughs> um, I don't know if you know that uh, the memory, the way the, the BPDK handles Hue pages have been, uh, has gone through a big change after 1805. So maybe you're going to have problems with that. We'll definitely take a look at it. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is um, you are using always a physical addresses for the Hue page mapping. Right, yeah. Uh, and I think that breaks or th that could break some uh, Pomo drivers. I think it's, uh, there's one nick that requires virtual addresses instead of physical addresses. They are counting on that. And they are spe specifying that when they uh, initialize the PMD. So, so, I mean, you are doing some modifications to how Hue pages are handling, and maybe some Pomo drivers are going to have problems with that. Yeah, before, we, before we release support or claim support for any individual NIC, we always, we always try to qualify it beforehand to make sure that it works the way that we expect it and all the features that we need to work, uh, work the way that our customers expect them to. So, there very well might be a NIC or two that we're going to have to make changes for you know as we go forward. We'll discover that during during yeah. testing, and I'm sure we'll need to come up with a, with a solution for that. Um, it depends on whether the NICs you're talking about are ones that we would actually support. Even um, yeah, I think it's one for uh, embedded systems. Uh, I don't remember now the name. Yeah, it it might not be relevant for us. I'm yeah, I would have to see. I think that's it. We're, we're a little over two minutes left, so okay. thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.